We need to help people build an immune system that can do active surveillance and find viruses and get rid of them, but also not overreact and cause all this unwanted inflammation that is really um, underlying a lot of the, uh, the uh, significant illness and death from COVID-19. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. And if you're worried about COVID-19 and how to protect yourself from it and what to do if you get sick and what's going on in general with the whole condition and what's happening to us from our perspective in functional medicine, then this podcast is one you're going to want to listen closely to. It's with my friend and colleague, uh, the medical director of the Ultra Wellness Center, Dr. Elizabeth Boham. Uh, who is an extraordinary physician. She's also a registered dietitian and an exercise physiologist. She teaches all over the world uh, in, in functional medicine, is on the faculty of the Institute for Functional Medicine, and she's just an extraordinary physician. And I'm so happy to have you here talking about something that is not so fun, which mm -hmm. is COVID-19. Thank you, Mark. It's great being with you. So, so tell us, where are we at today with COVID-19? How, how, how big of a problem is this? And, and uh, sort of tell us, you know, what, what is happening in the world of COVID? We're, yeah, it's not great, right? Mm -hmm. What are we at? 15 million people worldwide. That's of been, what today we're filming this is Jan July 24th. 15 right, million people have been infected. And, you know, as we were mentioning, that's probably a, we're way underestimating because of just how many people we're testing and just the quality of the testing as well. And, you know, it, it's it's causing a lot of of a lot of disease and death and illness, and um, it's changing people's lives significantly. You know, in terms of, of of you know their day to day life, what they can interact, their job. So it's it's significant. Something we really need to be focusing on. Yeah, it's it's, it's changed everything for everybody, right? And yeah. The, the fear factor is is big. It's huge. Right? And the 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 actual disease is bad. It's not mm -hmm. just like a flu. Now, some yeah. people get sick and they're fine. And, you know, you can say, well, 99% of people are fine. Yes, you know, up to 20% end up in the hospital, which is a lot of people when you look at scale, right? Yes, if, if, it's a lot of people. If, right? If there's 4 million Americans that have had it as of July 24th, and 20% of that is, you know, 800,000 people in the hospital. Right. So that's a, that's a lot of people. And then 5% of people get really, really sick, right? Yeah, and end up in the ICU. Right. And, you know, probably... 1% die. But when you look at the, the rate, I mean, the death rate, at, if you're over 60 is higher. If you're over 80, it's very, very high. So it's, it's far more than 1%. And I think that's something we've been, we've been talking a lot about and trying to determine what can people do to have less complications from COVID. And that's what we're going to really be delving into today. But we definitely see there's certain populations that are at much higher risk, right? People with, with underlying diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, COPD, right? Those people are at much higher like risk. Emphysema. Yep, like emphysema. I mean, in fact, I just saw or asthma. the CDC just put out that they feel that 41% of Americans are at high risk for complications from COVID because of underlying health issues. Right. I mean, six out of 10 of Americans have a chronic illness. Right. 75% are overweight, 42% are obese. Mm -hmm. We're know, not, we're not doing so great in this country, are diabetes. we? diabetes. Yeah. 88% mm -hmm. of us are metabolically unhealthy. And, and, and to varying degrees of how unhealthy you are, your risk goes up and up and up. And it's interesting that the diseases that are involved with, you know, uh, obesity, uh, heart disease, diabetes, you know, our, our poor diet, you know, really are, the, are some of the diseases that are really making an impact in terms of people or people's illness, morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. I think that's unfortunate, but interesting, you know, because of their immune system, probably. We'll talk a lot about that. Yeah, I mean, all these conditions, chronic chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. these are inflammatory diseases. Right. Being overweight is an inflammatory disease. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even have to be overweight. You can just be over fat. You can look skinny, but actually your body mass is mostly fat and not muscle. And that, and that makes you more likely to have more severe complications and more likely to die. So these are modifiable factors that you have control over. So you don't have to just wait like a sitting duck, mm -hmm. hoping you're you know, not gonna get COVID or hoping you're not gonna get sick from it. So there's so much you can do. And I, you know, unfortunately, this isn't getting enough press. You know, We're hearing about all right. these drug interventions. We're hearing about dexamethasone and remdesivir and 
monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma and all these things which have some role. Uh, but, but when you look at the impact that they have, it's, it's incremental. It's not like, mm -hmm. wow, this is the cure for COVID-19. No, it just helps a little bit in reducing the right. severity, reducing the complications, maybe, maybe reducing the risk of death. We don't even know yet, but we're looking at, you know, these drugs maybe reducing the length of stay in the ICU from 15 days to 11 days. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not like a blockbuster solution. So the, the, the real question is, how do we, how do we take this pandemic, which is causing so much dis disability uh, mm -hmm. and, and disruption and economic hardship for people, and how do we build a more resilient population using the right. principles of functional medicine? That's, a, that's what we need to do. You know, that's what this is going to help us do because, you know, we need to help people build an immune system that can do active surveillance and find viruses and get rid of them, but also not overreact and cause all this unwanted inflammation that is really um, underlying a lot of the, uh, the uh, significant illness and death from COVID-19. And, you know, they're looking at this inflammasome, right? The NLRF. Wait, uh, uh, NLRP3 inflammasome, right? You know, that is involved in causing more cytokine production, that cytokine storm that causes significant issues with Those people. Those are the uh, messengers of the immune system that create inflammation. Yeah, and they get out of hand in some people, right? And so that question is, which people do they get out of hand with? And People who come in pre-inflamed from diet. Right. <laughs> right. right. I mean, that same inflammasome, I guess, is upregulated also with obesity and diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's our, if people have that underlying inflammation already upregulated, and then this infection comes on top of it, it can be really difficult for certain populations. Um, and so that's something that we want to really be focusing on. And we know that there are things we can do that can influence it. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but, you know, other things that aren't really getting attention besides diet is, you know, our nutritional status as a population. Right. And, and, and I was talking to my colleague, Dr. Darish Mazafari, and at Tufts, who's the dean of the Tufts School of Nutrition, Science and Policy, and he said they have a whole department of nutritional immunology there where they've oh, identified cool. the key nutrients that actually help to modify your immune response and improve your overall immune function and actually may be effective in various pathways that have to do with COVID-19. And they're wanting to do a large study on it. But you're not hearing about this. Who's funding these studies? Right. There's billions of dollars flowing into vaccines and to very expensive drugs. But nobody's talking about the simplest things you can do to make yourself more resilient mm -hmm. in the face of COVID. So how do you, how do you make the host, you, more of a unwelcome place for the virus to land, or if you do get the virus, how do you actually make your body work properly to fight it more effectively so you don't end up in the hospital or you don't end up dying? Absolutely. We're obviously not doing a great job here in the U.S., but interesting about the, the nutrients, I think it's fascinating. They say that 1.5 million people wo worldwide are at risk for zinc deficiency, and, and zinc is one of those nutrients that's so critical for the functioning of the immune system, right? It helps both the innate and adaptive immune system. So when somebody's not getting enough zinc, it has a huge impact on their, uh, their risk of having issues with any illness. In fact, they did a study looking at patients with COVID-19 and they were in the hospital and they were getting medications. They had a cocktail of medications. One group they put on extra zinc and the other group, they didn't add the extra zinc. And the group that got the extra zinc had a much shorter hospital stay. So yeah. it's, it's fascinating. And, the problem and, is it's only pennies a dose, so nobody's making I out know, right? like a bandit. So nobody's mm -hmm. pushing it. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. And zinc is, is, is not hard to get. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's in a lot of our food sources. It's in a lot of our protein, both animal protein Pumpkin and seeds, nuts and seeds. Oysters. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, um, but, you know, when people have issues with just not having good food supply, you know, they're just not getting a, a, a good healthy diet for a whole host of reasons, or they're having a hard time with absorbing their zinc, or if they've got an inflammation in their digestive system that prevents optimal absorption of zinc, um, or if they're the elderly. I mean, what happens as we get older? We see a lot more zinc deficiency because, because people 
are eating less and less calories as they get older and they just it becomes one of those nutrients that people eat less of you know they're you know maybe choosing tea and toast for breakfast or they're skipping meals and they we do see zinc deficiency and that's one thing that a lot of um a lot of my patients especially uh, well actually most of my patients but definitely my older patients i have them take a little extra zinc because it's so important for their immune system Absolutely, and I think I think zinc is one of the key nutrients, and it actually interrupts some of the mechanistic pathways that SARS-CoV-2 actually uses to enter the cell. Right. So it actually there, there's a lot of science behind how this works. Mm -hmm. It's not just oh we're all zinc deficient. It actually has been shown to be mechanistically the right thing to do, yep. and and it, and the risk is low. I mean you don't want to overdose on zinc, but having adequate zinc is really important. And then, and then vitamin D is also one of those nutrients that's being used in various studies and showing benefit. And people who are, have low levels yes. of vitamin D seem to be at much higher risk of severe complications and death. Absolutely. And, you know, we test vitamin D all the time and we see so many people low in vitamin D. You know, when you start looking, you see a huge portion of our patients. I mean, we also work in the Northeast, but we get people from all over the world. And so many people are low in vitamin D for a whole host of reasons. I mean, I would and, say, unless you're a lifeguard, I mean, I would say 80% of our patients or more are low in vitamin D. And if, if, if you're not low in vitamin D, it's likely because you're taking vitamin D. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, well, the question is, what is low? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a sort of debatable number. But if you look at the lab reference value, low could be less than 20 or less than 30. Optimal is probably 40 to 60 or 70. Absolutely. And then what's the level that you need to optimize your immune system so you don't get COVID? It's probably like 50 or more. Yep. And I think that's not going to happen unless you're in the summer or if you're walking around naked half the day or you're, or you're living in the southern country where you're exposed to sunlight all the time. But most of us are not like that, and most of us are, are pretty significantly vitamin D insufficient or deficient. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, that this is also highlighted is um, how much time we spend inside, right? Because now I'm always telling people, I'm telling myself, spend more time outside because it's just it's just healthier when there's COVID around, right? You want to be in, interacting with nature. You want to have... Um, in, you know, parties outside or meetings, not that you want big parties, but meetings with other people outside, socially you know, distance. Socially I, don't distance. Like, so I don't like the term social distance. It's physical distance. <laughs> yes. You don't have to socially distance yourself. You don't have to physically distance yourself. And I think it's actually been a wonderful thing that so many of us have been spending more time outside. Everybody in the Northeast is camping now and kayaking and getting out and, and spending more time in nature. And that's, that's wonderful and is good for our vitamin D. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's another easy thing to do, which has low risk and lots yeah. of benefit. Um, another thing that's being looked at is is something called quercetin. So can you talk about what that right. is? And, and there's some some really interesting data on on quercetin and its effect on uh, particularly uh, COVID nineteen. So quercetin is a polyphenol, right? So these are these phytonutrients, these components in our plant foods, right? So phytonutrients are components in our plant foods that have really great health benefits for us. So we know we've got vitamins and minerals um, in our food, but we also have these phytonutrients. And these phytonutrients in the plant actually help the plant survive in nature. So what's amazing and what we're realizing is that our plant foods are packed full of these really great phytonutrients that have good health benefit for us. So they've been shown to be anti-inflammatory, they have high antioxidant capacity. You know, we've been using these, and, and there's lots of research on all of the different phytonutrients in terms of cancer prevention and heart disease prevention, but we also see that they impact the, uh, that inflammasome. Mm. So that, um, that, that, in, that, inflammasome that causes that increased cytokine production, we know that certain phytonutrients and polyphenols can lower, they can lower that cytokine production and influence it in a healthy way. So um, uh, quercetin is a mast cell stabilizer, right? We use it as a as a phytonutrient all the time for you know people with allergies and asthma and mast cell issues but it's also being looked at at impacting somebody's response to COVID-19. Yeah. And if people are taking, like some people take supplements, 500 milligrams a couple times a day, or even more, 1,000 milligrams a couple times a day. But also what's cool is it's in our plant foods. Yeah. So you, you know, it's in things like dill, and it's in broccoli, onions. and it's in onions, and capers, and um, apples, and berries, and 
it's in so many of our foods. And um, so what we're always working with people on is saying, okay, let's get those eight to 12 servings of phytonutrients every day. So they can be coming from your, your vegetables, your fruits, your spices, your teas. So many of these phytonutrients are phenomenal for your overall health and can lower that cytokine release and that inflammation that can come from uh, an infection. Yeah, and, and you know we're we're looking at all these expensive drugs, but there's actually research going on on things like quercetin. Mm -hmm. And for example, it it binds to the spike protein of the virus, which is necessary for it to bind and enter into the cell of the host. Right. It actually inhibits all sorts of inflammatory pathways, like we mentioned. It actually is directly antiviral. Yes. So it has antiviral, antiviral. capacities, yep. and it and it um, it inhibits the replication of infected cells. So it has all these different benefits and it's completely safe. Yep. It's in our food, but you can take it as a supplement. Yep, absolutely. So, so there's another one also that people are looking at, which is called ECG, which comes from green tea. Yeah, EGCG is epigallocatechin gallate, right? So it comes from your green tea. It's a component in green tea. And um, you, you know we've been studying it forever, especially in the uh, cancer prevention world. It's got a lot of antioxidant, anti-angiogenic properties. It, but it also helps with production of glutathione, which we'll talk more about. So, but e, uh, the, the EGCG in green tea is phenomenal in terms of this phytonutrient that has tremendous benefit in our body. And so they're looking at, you know, recommending four cups of green tea a day or 225 milligrams if you're getting it from a supplement, you know, can really do a lot of good benefit. So let's see, so you should have a meal with Oysters and pumpkin seeds for the zinc. You should yeah. have onions and dill for the quercetin. You have a little green tea in there. Yeah, and we can't forget you can about have, mushrooms. Have, you can have for mushrooms the, for the vitamin D. Yep, yeah. and, and the and natural herring. killer selectivity, right? Yes, herring. Uh, so that, that sounds like an interesting meal. <laughs> <laughs> and a little but, broccoli because that also has, broccoli has sulforaphane in it. And that is that we know is really important for also for production of glutathione. And there's really interesting research now looking at What's the connection with glutathione depletion and outcome from COVID-19? Hey, everybody. It's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you to all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I want to tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. Back up a little bit. So yeah. what is glutathione? Oh, yeah. Why is it important and why should we care? <laughs> I love talking about glutathione. It's like my favorite thing. See, me too. Yeah. I love glutathione. It is a master antioxidant and detoxifier in the body. We also know that it has tremendous impact on the immune system. Mm -hmm. So it can increase natural killer cells. It's which anti-inflammatory. Too. Yes, it's an anti-inflammatory too, right? So it can it can increase natural killer cells, which are the cells in your innate immune system, which go around and gobble up things that shouldn't be there, like viruses. So um, it can it can increase natural killer cell activity. It helps with increasing the function of the immune system. It can help with preventing the immune system from upregulating. So you know, or I'm sorry, up, of uh, overreacting, getting, yeah, overreacting, getting too inflamed. It's like the break. Kind of yeah, on the you know, so we said we want the immune system to find the infection, get rid of it, but not overreact and produce too many of these cytokines, if we, you know, unwanted cytokines. So glutathione actually does that. And, mm. and we've seen this forever, that glutathione has this tremendous ability 
in somebody's immune system. You know, we know when people have toxicity that depletes their body of glutathione, they're more at risk for getting infections. So, you know, they're really looking at people who are glutathione depleted and risk for COVID-19 or bad outcomes from COVID-19, really. And then, and so you want to think about what can I do to boost my glutathione in my body? Yeah. And, you know, we know that food has a tremendous impact here. We know that a lot of our vegetables naturally have glutathione in them. We know that we, a lot of our uh, vegetables like the cruciferous vegetables, the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, help the body with production of glutathione. And we and know- green that, tea, as you mentioned. And green tea helps with production of glutathione. We know that the garlic and onions and shallots help with production of glutathione. So, you know, our, our diet has a tremendous impact on our glutathione status. But then there are some people we give a little bit of extra love to in terms of glutathione, right? And we'll give them extra things like NAC. Yeah, which also has been looked at in COVID-19 as a Absolutely. compound that helps to boost glutathione and improve immune system and reduce infection. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Like 600 milligrams a couple times a day often we'll, we'll, we might use. Um, and then we sometimes give people actual glutathione, right? You can, you can get... Um, you know, glutathione is a tripeptide. It's made up of, of three different uh, proteins. Amino acids. Amino acids, yes, thank you. And so it gets, it, it gets digested in the digestive system. And so optimally, you want to get glutathione that's liposomal, which means it's a small particle that gets absorbed through the mucosa, through the mouth or the digestive system without getting broken down. Mm. Um, or we'll give glutathione uh, um, IV, or inhaled, yeah. yep, yep, intravenously or yeah. inhaled. Um, there's so many ways to give it, but it can it can be really helpful for somebody's immune system. And I've been keeping my eye on the literature and seeing case reports of intravenous glutathione in COVID-19 patients with remarkable quick results. Yeah. Uh, and also I've been hearing reports of inhaled glutathione or inhaled N-acetylcysteine, which yep. we actually use uh, all the time for asthma or cystic fibrosis patients. So yep. these are treatments that are available in traditional medicine, but they're not often used. Yep. And, and it's not like any one of these things is going to cure COVID or prevent you from getting it, but they all will help to bolster your own resiliency and your immune system and your ability to fight the infection. So instead of being sick for weeks and weeks and months, you might be having a shorter course. You might not really get sick at all, yep. uh, or you might recover a lot faster. Um, and there's a few other things that, that people are using out there and, and and I think that are worth talking about one of them is is um, you know melatonin uh, which also has some benefits yeah. as well in terms of this yeah there's some interesting research on melatonin we know it has um, antioxidant capacity and um, it, it does have an influence on our immune system you know and and so they're looking at melatonin for uh, for COVID as well, you know, even you know, three to five milligrams even at night or maybe higher for some. You know, it's interesting. We see, you know, I definitely have seen a, a bunch of patients who've had COVID nineteen, and I actually just ordered some inhaled glutathione just the other day, you know, through a nebulizer, mm -hmm. um, which was really helpful for for this patient for her COVID nineteen. Um, and she got, she recovered really well. And with somebody who had an immune system that we weren't sure how she was going to do, you know? Amazing. And so it, it was, it seemed to be very helpful, but we do have some patients that, that struggle. Right. And, um, you know, I, I've had a few patients who, who, who were sick March and April and still a few months later are dealing with fatigue, shortness of breath. That seems to be some of the lingering symptoms we see more of. Yeah. So, yeah. so one is how do you protect yourself so you don't get it? Right. Which is the lifestyle issues, diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, taking your basic supplements that we talked about. And then if you get it, what do you do? There's some sort of more advanced things you can do around, you know, maybe inhaled glutathione or NAC yep. and other treatments we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, but then there's this whole phenomenon that we're seeing called post-COVID syndrome. Yes. Which is, is terrifying to me because mm -hmm. with SARS, the previous infection, this is SARS-1, I guess you'd call it, uh, at, at, at three years, 40% of people who got this and survived had chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. And, and, and there's a study that was just published in the General of the American Medical Association looking at how uh, patients who had been hospitalized with COVID did after discharge. So 60 days later, they reached out to these patients, and these were COVID-positive patients who yep. were quite sick. Uh, 143 patients 
and and 72 percent had pneumonia so they were quite sick um, the average stay was about 13 days in the hospital uh, and about five percent were on ventilators at, at two months only about 12 percent were free of symptoms the rest right. had fatigue shortness of breath joint pain chest pain and worsened quality of life so 87 percent of people had symptoms like shortness of breath and fatigue at two months so i'm seeing some people who recover but there's a whole group that don't really get better now is right. this infection just lingering did it just script their immune system what's happening and so from a functional medicine perspective we're thinking about how do we address these patients how do we help them right. recover from this just like we treat chronic fatigue patients with functional medicine who've been Absolutely. maybe affected by viruses or tick infections we know how to do this and yeah. so i i really think you know, if, if it's true that we now have 4 million people in America with COVID, which is probably actually 10 times that according probably, to the study, right? because many people aren't tested or diagnosed or have more mild cases. So if we have 40 million people in America with COVID, a bunch of those are going to have this post-COVID syndrome. And the question mm -hmm. is, what can be done to help these people over time? Yeah, and I think looking at, you know, their glutathione status is really important. You know, we do that with markers of, of you know, we have some biomarkers we can look at um, and and we can just work to you know, things like oxidative stress and glutathione uh, biomarkers that can be helpful to give us a sense of what somebody's levels are. And then we work to really boost up that glutathione with, like we were talking about, you know, the precursors to it, the actual glutathione, the diet. And, and then we look at, we look at all aspects of that person's health, you know, in terms of, uh, um, you know, how do we boost their uh, adrenal gland? How do we boost their mitochondria, which, you know, and help it heal after getting an illness like this? You know, sometimes you do need a, a lot of, a little extra TLC after you get sick. Um, to, to bounce back. And we definitely see people, I mean, we've, like you said, we've seen this for, for years with other sorts of infections and, and we're seeing it now for some a portion of people with COVID-19, you know, they just need a little extra support for their body to truly recover. And that's, it's an interesting thing to be paying attention to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, and, you know, we, 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 we skipped over it a little bit, but there are other things that people are, are looking at as well for, uh, helping prevent or even treat, uh, COVID, which is something called NAD, uh, yeah. which is helping your energy set system, but it also seems to be effective in in some of the problems that we see as well. And also, our gut um, yeah. is a big player, and people who have more gut dysfunction, because COVID also affects the gut, seem yeah. to have more issues. Yes, yeah, a lot of people have some GI issues that then you know we need to think about how can we help support. You know, when you think about things like uh, probiotics because our good bacteria that line our digestive system, that line our nasal passageways. You know, that actually is we've talked about this before is like the first line of defense in the body, right? That's really important for our immune system, and and so so you know eating a diet that's that feeds our good bacteria or taking extra probiotics really can help support the immune system. And there's certain strains that they're really looking at that may be effective for prevention of getting the virus, as well as things that can help with recovery of the digestive system. Yeah, and then also pre and probiotic foods that we've talked yeah. about a lot. So those those are all ways to support yourself. And there's other things that, that can be help, helpful, such as herbs like astragalus and mushrooms like reishi. Talk a little bit about how these things work and, and why would we sort of want to use herbs in this context? Yeah, so you know, um, I love I love the medicinal mushrooms. I love the Asian mushrooms because they have tremendous. Uh, uh, sh they can really strengthen our immune system through improving our natural killer cell activity. So they. Those are a little Pac-Man that go around and kill things, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we like the Asian mushrooms, shiitake, mitake, um, uh, reishi. They they they're really powerful, both to cook with, and then some people take extra supplements or teas or coffees with them in them. So you know, they're really uh, something we focus on a lot, and. I think the one, you know, we were asking about herbs in general, you know, as we were mentioning before about the, the polyphenols, the, the components in our plant foods that have tremendous health benefit, right? They're, they have this, they have, many of them have a really nice anti-inflammatory benefit for the body. And one of the things we really want to focus on is cooling down that inflammatory response mm -hmm. in the body, because that, that is what is causing a lot of that continued, well, it's probably what's causing a lot of that continued shortness of breath feeling and fatigue. Yeah, so. and, and I want to be clear what we're talking about. We're not, we're not saying these are 
cures or going to fix everything. But what we're saying is that there are ways to make yourself more resilient, to improve your immune yeah. function, to make it less likely that you're going to get sick, or if you get sick, less likely you're going to get very sick or end up in the hospital or even dying. So when it's not just any one supplement that's going to cure you, it's like you just take zinc and that's it. No, you have mm -hmm. to eat right. You have to yeah. exercise. You have to sleep. You have to deal with your stress. And you have to make sure your nutritional status is optimized. And I think, and I think all these things can be extremely helpful. What, what I, I, and, and for those listening, you're probably trying to furiously take notes. And what was that thing you said? And what was that supplement? All of this we're going to have in the show notes. So you're going to have a list of everything we're talking about, both in terms of what to do for prevention, what things you can do to support yourself if you do get sick, and what to do afterwards to make sure that you address what we are calling post-COVID syndrome. But what's interesting in the literature to me, Dr. Boehm, Liz, is that there are a number of countries doing things that we're not doing here that are seemingly very effective. Uh, and and yes. a lot of these are what we call oxidative therapies. Yeah. So oxidative therapy seems like a crazy idea because why aren't we all taking antioxidants and should, why would we want to take something that's going to oxidize us? But, but these compounds seem to have an ability to create um, a, a response in the body that, mm -hmm. that sort of activates its defenses. So it's like you, like you get punched in the face, so all of a sudden you're going to like put your fists up and you're going to start fighting. It's the same way with the body. When it gets a little stress, it actually starts to kick in its own yes. immune function. It's, so it's own, okay, I got to get working here. Right. It's all stem cells. And so things like vitamin C intravenously have been mm -hmm. used in China. We're showing effect. intravenous glutathione. There's been studies on that. Yep. Um, intravenous NAD. And, and something called ozone, which is uh, something we've talked a little bit about. But this is uh, uh, something that's involved in, in helping to create a, a an increased immune response for the anti-inflammatory stuff and decreasing the yep. inflammatory stuff in your body and also maybe germicidal. And, and right now there's uh, many trials going on in Europe, not here, but in Europe there's mm -hmm. uh, 800 people being enrolled in trials in over 26 hospitals. The case reports that are coming out are pretty extraordinary. I just reviewed a case series of three patients that was published in a medical journal which showed that they're, uh, and these are patients sick with pneumonia and with very right. high levels of these markers like D-dimer, which shows your yeah. blood's clotting, or C-reactive protein, uh, yeah. which shows that you have a lot of inflammation, or ferritin, which shows you have a lot of inflammation. Yeah. And so these are really objective biomarkers, and they also looked at CAT scans and x-rays, and you could see within literally days, these people yeah. got better, and their oxygen levels came up, their inflammatory markers went down, their x-rays cleared within a couple of days, and these patients are going home after three days. Yeah. Where the average stay is like, you know, 10, 11, 12 days for these patients with COVID. This is a game changer. There's no other therapy like that. So I'm not saying it's the cure for COVID-19, but I, I do think it's it's one of those things we should explore. The problem is that it's, it's such a weird therapy. It's not really something that's part of conventional thinking or medicine in the United States. In many other countries, it's used in hospitals, uh, whether it's South America, Europe, China. I think, I think we need to start thinking about how do we, how do we look at these therapies, it, given that this is probably in my lifetime, in most of our lifetimes, the biggest threat we've seen to our social fabric, to our economic welfare, to just our sense of being able to be in the world again. I mean, right. because Yes, there's the pandemic of the virus, but there's also the pandemic of fear, which is going to outlast the virus. That's and if we true. could have a way of treating people, which help them feel confident that, you know, like, wow, if I get a strep throat, you know, I'll take an antibiotic, I'll be fine. So I'm, I'm hoping some of these therapies are going to get studied and looked at a little more in depth. And, you know, that's what we, we see that all the time in our clinic, right? When we have patients and we've had with, with chronic fatigue from other viruses, Epstein-Barr or a tick-borne infection, often the thing that helps them get better for the people that are having a really hard time recovering is a lot of these IV therapies and IVC, IV ozone. We see, we, that's when we start to see some people turn the corner. And, and for the people that are really struggling and their body's not kicking in and improving, yeah. we see big improvements. So yeah, it's, it's sort of like jump-starting your body's own healing system because yeah. the body has a healing system and often it gets stuck. And I think that's what's happening with COVID. You get this insult and yes. the body gets stuck in this cycle of being sick. And inflammation, and, right? Yeah, and, and I, I've been talking to people, even young people in their 20s and 30s who get it, and it's not like they're back to normal. You know, right. like they're, they're, they're struggling with fatigue, they're struggling with 
shortness of breath, with chest tightness, their so tests are negative. You know, does the virus persist? We don't know. But I, I think I think this is certainly a real thing, and I, I, I think we are really focused uh, at the Ultra Wellness Center and Functional Medicine trying to sort of help people through this process using a very uh, science-based, coherent, um, and safe and effective way to help yeah. support their own body and their healing response that they can create through these various treatments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, we are all uh, struggling with, with coronavirus, um, both personally and how it's affecting all of our lives and, and professionally in the healthcare system, it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the cases now are just skyrocketing. I think the, the cases in Florida and the South and Texas are just on the rise. And, and I think this is far from over. So I, I think these kinds of approaches, if we could scale up, you know, a nutritional awareness approach. Imagine if, if, if right. you know, the government was like, okay, let's have a public health awareness campaign. Eat these foods. Don't eat these foods. Like if we all got metabolically yeah. healthy and it doesn't take years. I mean, you take no. someone with diabetes who's 400 pounds who has gastric bypass surgery, their diabetes is gone in two weeks. They're mm -hmm. still very overweight. What changed wasn't their weight. What changed was their diet. Yep. And you can quickly change your metabolic health. You can quickly change inflammation. After a meal. A, After a meal, right? Yeah, one meal. Wait, but, one you know, meal. give yourself yep. 10 days of a clean okay, diet. There you go. And you're going to see drama <laughs> a dramatic change. And so yeah. we should be educating people about that. We should be educating them about nutritional uh, support. And, yeah. and, and, you know, people just take a multivitamin and vitamin D. That's usually enough for most people. It has a zinc in there. Mm -hmm. it has, it maybe Some you want to add a little quercetin. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, you know, these are things that are, are very safe. They're very effective, and, and, and unfortunately, they're underutilized. Uh, and when we see right. the studies showing that 88% are metabolically unhealthy and over 90% are nutrition de nutritionally deficient in one or more nutrient, including things like vitamin D and zinc and omega-3s, all the things that are really matter, you know, these are, these are things that we can do something about as a society. And yes, we have to do all the things we need to do to, to, to investigate new drugs and, you know, mm -hmm. the vaccine uh, issue is a whole quagmire. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but, you know, hopefully it's a miracle vaccine, uh, although I, th I think there are a lot of challenges to that. And I think that both in terms of people adopting it and actually it working. Uh, but, I, but I think that these kinds of things we're talking about today are things that we can all do now, that we can all do to support ourselves. And mm -hmm. so in the show notes, there's going to be all this information, what to do and how to eat and what supplements we recommend. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out and uh, and don't don't fret because, uh, you know, fear is the worst thing about this. And I think yeah. to quote Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And I think if you can feel empowered by understanding what to do, both to prevent it, if you get it, and afterwards, I think it, it will reduce a lot of that. I agree. I agree. Well, Dr. Boehm, Liz, thank you so much for being on The Doctor's Pharmacy. It's been great having this conversation about this very tough subject, but there is hope, and and uh, I encourage everybody listening to this, if you love this podcast, to share it with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark.